Now we've got time, not as much as I thought, for questions. Peter, if, uh, and uh, also Esther, if I could, in a way, put to you first question. Going back uh, to my early days, and also talking quite much to different uh, refugees across Australia, I'm always told that certainly employment is the first thing which is on their mind, but the second thing is the issues associated with recognition of their qualifications. Because people who are coming as skills migrants, they in a way got their qualifications assessed over there, they are coming to the job. When you arrive here as a refugee, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have that qualifications. Going back to op old COPQ, it didn't work very well. What's happening now in this area? So. Um Again, we came to the conclusion that the existing Commonwealth scheme is only partially successful. And we've got to get it better because the Syrian group, in particular, Syrian refugees, are distinguished in one key way from many other refugee groups, is they tend to be, uh, have experience in business or be professional. So very few of them have English, although most of them arrive able to speak at least two languages. But they tend to be a professional white-collar refugee group. Uh, and so therefore we're moving to try and get um, their overseas qualifications uh, recognised. There are a number of twists on this though. The first is that in fact what most refugees often bring, unless they happen to have got a university degree, which is much easier, but what they happen to bring very often is overseas work experience rather than qualifications. That's a problem. If I meet a Syrian or Iraqi auto mechanic, I'm sure they've worked as an auto mechanic. I'm pretty confident they won't have done a, or have a piece of paper that says they've done a four-year apprenticeship in auto mechanics. So it's limited what you can do. The second thing, and we've discovered this in the Refugee Employment Support Programme, is one of the challenges is to get our refugees to understand that even when we've got that recognised, that doesn't guarantee you a job. Uh, one of the problems we're facing at the moment is people who have got their, for example, their accountancy skills recognised, but then can't get a job. Uh, because what they're starting to realise is that's just the first stage. And it's one of the difficulty things is saying, look, I'm sorry you've got to go back because it's no use getting your accountancy degree recognised unless you can actually talk to people about how to use MYOB. It's not going to cut the mustard. So one of the things we're doing in, with the Refugee Employment Support Programme is trying to provide that work experience which actually will help to get those overseas qualifications realistic. Uh, we've got overseas qualifications of architects. One of the problems is most of the architects from Iraq and Syria have not been trained in computer architecture. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, the other thing we're discovering is that um, sometimes we forget how much the Australian workforce has moved on over the last 15 years, which may not be the case in many of the countries from which refugees case come. Uh, in general, if you're a refugee used to office work uh, uh, in Syria or Iraq, uh, you find your first few weeks in Australia utterly bemusing because you're much used to much greater hierarchy where you will constantly be reporting to your supervisor about the work you're doing or someone will be reporting to you. What we now accept that, you know, you have a discussion and then you're expected to get on your, you yourself it. for three or four days is quite different. And that's why we've discovered even in the New South Wales public service, what makes it work is if you've got a buddy or a mentor who can be with you in those first four weeks so that you start to understand, you know, how, how our, uh, our white-collar workforce works. Esther, anything to I think um, Peter's covered it really well, but just to add that, that the last point that Peter made, which is front of mind for us, is about Australian workplace acculturation. That is a really big issue for newcomers to Australia. So, like Peter said, you might have the experience, um, but you might even land that first job, but actually keeping it, thriving in it, uh, understanding the mores of an Australian workplace, the culture, the organising culture, as Peter said, the hierarchy, the way it works, 
um, it is a very, very different environment. So the experience centre that um, Peter touched on before, um, up the road, is aimed at actually giving people contemporary yeah. white collar problems to solve in an Australian environment. So it actually starts to shift people's thinking to an Australian employment context. And that's the first time we've actually done that in Australia. It's, quite, it's really exciting, actually, this new adventure. But uh, really what it is is that, say you... Um, like that, say, say you're, um, um, say you're a, an IT professional and there's a problem that you need to solve. The Experience Centre will allow you to actually problem solve a real IT problem in an Australian environment. And you'll walk away from that experience skilled up and more confident. And that's really important. I think the other issues, Sev, around overseas qualifications that we're finding through the rest and through our job active provision um, is the influence um, and the power that industry bodies yield. It's not just about getting that qualification recognised, it's getting that industry to recognise you as a valid uh, person in that industry. And we're doing a lot of work uh, with industry bodies as well and with testing. Um, so there's a lot of innovation at the moment happening um, in the employment readiness space. Thank you. Now, the floor is open to your questions. Gentleman, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Maliate from the United Nations Association. I've got two questions, if I uh, could have your indulgence. But firstly, thank you so much for your uh, excellent presentations this evening. My first question is, do you feel that, um, given the challenges that we're facing, things are getting better or worse? So it's a quick answer. And my second question is, if you had a magic wand and felt that there was one thing that you could do that would make a big difference, what would it be? Uh, better in terms of refugees, yes. uh, worse in terms of people who are here on bridging visas. Um, better, definitely better in terms of settlement. So if I compare, for example, my mother's experience of settlement in Australia to a woman coming now in her situation, I think absolutely better. I, I can't, as a settlement professional, um, if I was to think it wasn't better, then I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing because that would question my efficiency as well and my effectiveness, and I think it's definitely better. Um, as, a, as, a, as a daughter of migrants, um, I think a, a, a daughter of migrants now to a daughter of migrants in the 60s and 70s will hopefully, I believe, very optimistically, has more opportunities. Um, so I think definitely better. Uh, and I agree with Peter in terms of, I guess, how we treat those who have a temporary status, yeah. uh, people who aren't necessarily here to stay when they first get here, um, but do eventually end up staying. I think how we treat them in that interim period really needs cause for reflection. There's a lot more we can do to help people feel um, welcome and integrated earlier, because they too do tend to stay. So I think that's a space that we really need to think about. I think in the space of skilled migrants as well, um, I think there's more work that can be done there. So for example, when I started as an old grant and aid worker, which is essentially a settlement worker now, um, we could see anyone who needed our support. So as I was fresh out of social work, um, I didn't. my intervention and my support wasn't dictated by a visa type. It was dictated by the needs of the person before me. And I made a professional judgement about how much or how little that support was needed um, based on that person's capacity and their strength. Uh, these days, our, our responses are becoming more and more visa-driven. So I think in that regard, we're not better off, no. Your magic wish? No? I won't. Oh, so... Um, or too difficult? No, no. Well, if I had a magic wish... It would be that all of those who, who are here in Australia right now on temporary visas, quietly, without any publicity, without sending out any signals uh, internationally, uh, we just put them on the pathway to permanent residency. Thank you. Uh, I think gentlemen over there and then Mary. Right. Can I just talk about my wish? Oh, sorry. Right? Oh, yeah. Because um, yeah. I don't Your, often get I, I saw the same. I don't often get. No, it's not the same. My wish, as a as a um, as a like as a, as as a citizen of the country, um, is to have a public narrative that is based on fact, opportunity, and optimism, and not just um, a very simplistic 
uh, like when I started in the sector, the dialogue in the 80s and into the 90s was much more sophisticated, more optimistic, um, and I think more inclusive. So I think getting some balance back in our public narrative, I think, is really important, and that our academics and, and leaders um, have a sense of confidence that they can speak to truth, um, and that it's not about masking the difficulties at all. Like, I'm not talking about it's not perfect, you know, not everything that happens is perfect, but I think having honest, factual, data-driven conversations, I think, is, is something that I'd wish for going forward. Thank you. My question is to Professor Crock. Ah. Ah, okay. So it's some kind of agreement. You both <laughs> put hands together. No, 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 no. no, I saw her probably around the law faculty, which I visit just for lectures like this. But my question was, if you, for example, found that the Australian government had not uh, followed the law in terms of settlement of children, could it be that somebody lodges what is called a PIL against the government and get the court order to force the government to change what they are doing? Mm. Yeah, Mary, answer. It's more complex. I will okay. come to it. So, um, there have been many, many actions brought against Australia in um, the in various international fora um, before the uh, Human Rights Committee, um, the Torture Committee, uh, all sorts of organisations. Um, they've found Convention on the Rights of the Child, Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, we decided back in about 1999 that um, with a case called Sadiq Elmi, um, that we would disregard what the UN says. And in fact, uh, the fact that tonight, the lead story on the BBC, after discussion of the hurricane that's just taken half of America apart, was um, uh, save, save the children? Med Médecins Sans Frontières have just been They've just been chucked out of, of Nauru and they are calling for the, these people to be brought to Australia immediately. Um, so look, uh, I think in answer to your question, this is not about me tonight. Um, it's actually about two amazing people who have given, I think, an extraordinary um, account of our best nature here yeah. because we are very much a two-faced country in the way that we treat refugees. Uh, yeah. I've been in this area now for, uh, you're a kid, right? Uh, I think I started in 1985. You're a kid. <laughs> um, you're a kid. Yeah. <laughs> Tell her she's a kid. <laughs> um, but I actually have a question for both of you. Um, uh, I helped set up the first community legal centre yeah. in this area in Melbourne. Um, but I've been deeply involved with the settlement side as well as the legal side forever. Um, one of my books is on the settlement of children, actually, that I published a couple of years ago. Um, more recently, I've become interested also in other types of vulnerable refugees, and this is my question. Uh, Professor Shergold described the change that has occurred in the pattern of the refugees coming to Australian very recent years, it, that change has actually brought a lot more people with disabilities coming into the country. And I would like to ask both of you, I'm very interested that SSI are now getting into the disability space, which is marvellous. Again, this is a problem, this is an area where you get the two sides of Australia playing out. The fact that uh, migrants are now excluded for 10 years from any disability set, uh, services. Um, I'm interested in knowing what's happening in that space, what you're doing to actually identify disabilities within the cohorts that you're working with, because our experience internationally that I've been doing with Professor McCallum um, is that in many uh, refugee communities, they go out of their way to hide their disability, and that makes it extraordinarily difficult for you as settlement providers to actually help people, give them that extra leg up that they need. 
So that's my question. I think it's a, do you want me to go first? Yeah, you can. I think it's a, um, Mary's question's a really interesting one. I think that um, the presentation of, um, you know, issues around how able-bodied someone is or the intellectual um, ability, it is on the increase. And our, our settlement providers who are doing the work at the coalface, like Anthony, um, who's here, they're telling us that more and more, and the data is telling us that at early at the early stage. Um, I think that the big challenge, uh, this will come to pass um, in the context of the NDIS. I think that the NDIS has, a, as a system, has the opportunity to uh, do more with people of diverse um, language backgrounds. Uptake, uh, I understand, is not as high as it should be as a proportion um, to the diversity of our Australian population. I think it's on the increase, which is really good. So there's still some work to do in terms of the bridge um, for people through the NDIS. I think what makes it more complex in a disability context um, is what you said before about shame, a, a lack of awareness often, um, as well as I think the intellectual um, side of disability is harder to, I guess, diagnose and present than, say, a physical um, disability. So I think cultural mores experience from the home country, um, whether you view it as a stigma or not, you know, all those cultural overlays um, in the way that disability is viewed does make that a, a challenge and I think it's an, you've touched on an area that does need uh, more to be done. I think the other area of vulnerability um, on the increase is women. Um, I don't think that has changed much in my time, um, particularly um, women who are potentially in domestic violence situations. I think that's another area of vulnerability because their whole sense of security um, is under threat uh, if, they, if they're in a difficult um, situation at home. And I don't think, I still think there's a lot of work to do in the domestic and family violence space as well. So in terms of vulnerability, they're probably the two that are front of mind for me. Yeah. I'm sure Pete's got another one. No, no, I, look, you're a, you're someone overseas, you're hoping to win the jackpot. The jackpot is getting accepted as a refugee in Australia. Yep. So it stands to reason that you are going to hide as much as you can any ill health in your family or any disability in your family. Having said that, it is good some people to declare it and still get accepted to come. But on the whole, you're hiding. So there are three problems, and I think we're dealing well with two and not with third. And, and partly, I have to say, is because with two of them, uh, they're predominantly matters for the state and therefore easier. Disability, as we now know, has increasingly moved to the Commonwealth. With health, I think now we're doing many more refugee health checks, both in schools, but then using schools to also do the mums. We are identifying many more health problems, which previously would have been sat there for many years quicker and able to deal with them. So tick, I think we're nurses. definitely doing that be be better. Through the nurses. I, yeah, through yes. the nurses. Uh, I think the second thing, which is a much harder problem, is to dis be able to distinguish between odd behaviour from someone who's suffering trauma against odd behaviour from someone who is suffering from a long-standing uh, mental ill health problem. I think through the department and particularly through working with starts, again, we're doing much better at being able to do that and quickly. The third area is disability. I think we are doing better at getting it recognised. However, uh, it's being caught up in what I think is the, uh, what I think is unfortunately uh, turning into the bureaucratic nightmare of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. This was a scheme launched wonderfully with the right ethos about allowing people with disability or family with disabilities to can take control of their own services. You know, I saw it operate in WA, I thought it was the model to have. But unfortunately, because I'd have to say, I think many states uh, wanting, sawing the Commonwealth so keen for a deal, have put many more people across than were initially anticipated. So much of the NDIS funding is probably being spent on lower level, not Long, but lower level disability than was anticipated. And my view, we've got to get back and focus on major disabilities and, and, and refugees and migrants more generally have got, have got to be part of that. 
and we've got to try and expedite them getting into the NDIS system, which uh, is what we're doing. I think we are already on time, so I will allow to one short question before I will finish. Yes, you. Um, I'm an ex-refugee, uh, so I'm happy to talk to anyone that I can share my experiences with. And, but my question is, uh, why aren't there any more kind of refugees here? I mean, it's a wonderful event with wonderful food and stuff, and is it a secret society? meeting yeah. here or something? I think we'll have to wait with responding to the question <laughs> when Ahmed will come here and I will uh, give, <laughs> Good one. And I will give to <laughs> Ahmed uh, a microphone in a moment. But before we do it, I would like to ask Jane Anderson, uh, to, uh, manager of multicultural engagement at TAFE New South Wales, to come forward and present a small gift of appreciation to Peter. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm falling apart there. Yeah. And now can I ask Caroline Valbuena, who is principal manager at the Department of Premier and Cabinet, to present a gift to Esther. Oh. 